So today we're gonna go do a retake because so few of you are handing in your posts and um, not coming to office hours and not letting me know what's going on. So that's all right. Um, I'm going to start now going back to the beginning of the class and just going through every attachment and I will ask you questions and I want you to get out a piece of paper and a pencil, okay? So make sure you have paper and pencil handy. And for every attachment, I'm gonna say, what do you think of that? And then I'll give you a minute to write down your thoughts. And if you've already posted something, you just add something else. There's always other ways to connect the material. Um, and then when you're all done, when we're all done, your post for today is post number six. And it, when you're done taking notes for today, you type it all up and that's your post. And it should be pretty long, but it's your summary of what the class has meant to you so far. Then for each day that you haven't posted yet, you go to that part of the post and get some ideas. Then you'll get some ideas and then you can go write your posts that are overdue, right? So at least you'll have some ideas. So then after that, starting um, with the next class, the posts are due one week after the class, unless there's some reason. And if there's a reason, you just type it in the beginning of the post. Because I, you know, basically figured you'd keep up and students aren't keeping up and they're getting too far behind. So I have to have an incentive and I'll knock off some points if it doesn't come in within that week, okay? Um, and I, you know, some of you, oh, but my electricity goes down. I understand, I understand, right? Or my family has COVID, I understand. <laughs> it's nothing like that. You, I will make very reasonable judgments. <laughs> All you do, you don't panic. See, I'm trying, I was trying to get it so you wouldn't panic. But by now, I can imagine some of you are panicked because you're behind by three weeks. <laughs> so that didn't work. So now I'm going to try to do it in a way that minimizes panic attacks, right? So, um, so just write in what the reason would be. And if it's electricity down, if it's COVID, it, what, you know, I am not going to punish you because you have even more obstacles. <laughs> you can just trust me on that. I'm not someone to be afraid of. But I will start knocking down, you know, some points if you don't get it in within a week. And that's starting next time for the assignment is due, the assignment for the next class is due a week from the next class, okay? All right, so now let's go back to the first class and let's just do it all. So take notes, okay? Take good notes. The better your notes are, the higher your grade will be on this post and also on the other posts because the more you can write, for example, on class number three, the more you can look back and lift those ideas out and make a post for class number three that will be better. So, so you know, figure out a, 
a fast way to jot notes that you can type up. Um, all right, so here we go. All right, the first, let me go back to the syllabus, just to remind you of what we've got, where we've been, where we're going. Um, okay, so we've had this, I'll go through this one. That was optional. You didn't have to post for the first day, I, I don't think. Then we had Bacon, Locke, um, Galileo. You didn't have to talk about Galileo. Bacon and Locke and the notion of rights and property rights. Then we had uh, Kant. And then we had utilitarianism. Then we had Marxism. So your first paper was, I have had, I've gotten three of them. But one of them really was a research paper. It was not a paper about how has the Enlightenment culture led to colonialism. So you need to talk about these ideas that we covered in class. And I'll, I'll show you that because I'll show you one of the papers and how that paper did what I asked, okay? So, um, then, starting today, toward the end of the day, we will go over the reading that was you should have read today about Christianity. And then, for, um, for the next class, there's one reading on Islamic ethics, but I want you to go find your own article about Islam and environmental protection and you report to the whole class about it and what you like or don't like. So we're going to have, start having more of that from now on where students bring their own examples. So I will try to assign shorter readings. I, I hope you understand why so far I've been in charge because it would be hard for you to find online this, you know, the whole, the history. And I gave you a lot of, you know, short five page readings and then outlines. So I tried to fill in the historical context. And from now on, the religious uh, beliefs are uh, the people who you read know those beliefs. And I would like you, there's ideas we're going to cover today about whether the religious beliefs are the problem. Are they what's behind how your countries exploit the environment? Is it because of your religion or is it because of industry and science and technology and democ democratization, right? So you can, these same concepts, what was the cause? Was it religion or was it this other cultural shift um, that was really driving all this? And then the third article you had for today was a different interpretation of Christianity. So when we go through all these religions, you need to think about how everything we read today about the West and Christianity could apply to you, your country, your religion, or your secular humanism. If you're a secular humanist, that's great. I have, you know, I'm perfectly fine with that. You just have to um, explain, you know. It's very possible that the reason some of the students are is because they noticed how religion got used to exploit nature or to, ex to use as a weapon or whatever. There's lots of reasons people have for becoming flaming atheists. <laughs> and I don't care, I'm a philosopher, I don't care. I just care what your reasons are and I care how you live. So that's my concern. Let's just look ahead though. Um, it turns out I have a conference I'm attending 
on June 23rd. So I think I'm just going to have to um, do that one online and you'll have to write. I'll give you um, I'll give you an assignment about finding some sort of humanistic point of view and you'll have to write a longer post on that. We will do a makeup day because there's so many days this class is missing. And then we go into specific issues. You have a research paper coming up and that's a specific problem in your country, biodiversity, overpopulation, whatever problem you want to address. And then we have the final paper, which is just about my environmental ethic. What have I taken from what we've studied and what do I want to do moving forward? Okay, so please look at the syllabus, you know, if you have questions. Um, I'm not sure how many people wrote in their calendars that there was a paper due, but okay. You've been warned now. All right. The first day I did put this up, this paradigm and paradigm shift up on the screen. And I can imagine it probably didn't mean very much to you then, but I hope you understand it now, right? So we have Aristotle's virtues. We have um, Augustine and we have covered Aquinas. Um, and so when Lynn White talks about the Greco-Roman tradition and the Judeo-Christian tradition, you have a vague idea, right? You have a basic idea of what they're talking about. So he said the Greco-Roman doesn't have an origin to the creation and it doesn't have a personal God that created the universe. The Judeo-Christian tradition does. Uh, it's a very personal God who decided to create, right? So what does that mean for environmental issues? That's the kind of stuff that Lynn White's talking about, that Dobal is talking about, and that you can think, if you, if you come from an Islamic country, this is, the Judeo-Christian is a lot more like Islam than it is like Hinduism or Buddhism or Confucianism, right? So you can think about that. Then this other issue, which uh, Moncrief emphasizes, the real cause of environmental destruction is science. Francis Bacon says the purpose of scientific knowledge is power over nature indefinitely, right? Bacon doesn't give any limits to it. Then there's Locke's view of rights. I have a right to exploit natural resources. I have a right to push the indigenous people off the land because they're not giving it enough value. I have a, if I cut down trees and create all this wealth, I have a right to the money I get for doing it. Locke didn't want money, but obviously we have money and that's the way it works now, right? And then we, we studied Mill utilitarianism and we studied Kant. So, so this is where this, hopefully this paradigm um, switch in paradigms from ancient to modern makes sense to you. The science was different, inequality, all those other values changed. Now it's equality, freedom, rights, progress, all this wonderful stuff. So I want you to think about and tell me about how has your culture been influenced? First of all, how has your natural how have, has your physical country been influenced by the exploitation of these resources? But the second part is the culture, how people think about it, how Westerners, the concepts they use to justify it. Then you have to think about, well, have the people in my country, have they 
been, have their minds been colonized? You know, there's a difference between just physically being exploited and actually going along with it, thinking the way Westerners think, right? So how, how is it that your idea of pleasure, pain, and happiness has been corrupted by, um, by the West? You have to think about that, right? It might have to do with me, or it might have to do with the way my family or my political leaders or my teachers, the way they talk about stuff. So I want you to think about that. And then we will, we will talk more about systems thinking later on, a new paradigm, right? Where everything is interconnected. So obviously the gap between the modern world that was individualistic, everyone counts as one, freedom, equality, minimal uh, relation, you know, people are not interconnected. They get to choose everything they want to a system where everything is interconnected. Everything you do has political consequences. You, you, you can't think of yourself as an individual apart from the biosphere, the ecosphere, the international cultural sphere. So that's where we're going. Um, and that's later on in the class. We're going to do another paradigm shift. All right. So why don't you write down, I'll give you a minute, your first thoughts about the paradigm shift. What is it that you're thinking about now that you weren't thinking about when the class started? And I just put that up on the screen. So let me just give you a minute or two to brainstorm about that. Okay, so the next thing I want you to think about is I did talk about Aristotle's virtues and um, you could think about if somebody had asked you or even now if somebody asks you, who, who do you think of as a virtuous person and what qualities do they have? would you think about their carbon footprint, right? The fact that they choose uh, a minimal carbon lifestyle, would that be something you would consider to be virtuous? Or is that something most people are either forced into doing or they don't do it? <laughs> so um, you can think about, do I want to think about virtue? as at least one component of it is somebody who takes that into consideration along with all the other judgments they make. So I would never advocate, okay, I fly to Greece every summer because that's my scholarship. That's what I work on. I do it because I think the culture has this model of sustainability. So it is related but I do use fossil fuels when I fly to Greece. So what I'm saying is that you do have to balance stuff, right? So, I, so do not 
fail to take every opportunity to develop yourself um, just because of the carbon footprint. That's not your fault. But on the other hand, do I want to make conscientiousness about water consumption, plastics, uh, wasting food, all that other, you know, there's decisions you make every day. How much water you use in the shower, how cold or hot. I don't, again, most of you are so much lower carbon footprint than I am. Um, even though I'm low, you know, for, for an American or somebody, but um, anyway, just the idea that that's part of being a virtuous person. So I, so I'm going to stop for a minute and it also involves political, right? Every aspect of carbon footprint in your life isn't just about you and your happiness or your pleasure and pain. It's about everybody, right? So I'll give you a minute just to talk about, have you thought about that in the past as part of virtue? But moving forward, would you like that to be part of your consciousness? It's just that you're aware that we're all connected and carbon footprint is personal, social, political, international. So I'll just give you a minute to write notes to yourself about that. So another thing to notice moving forward is that in a very short time, within a decade, your country, your political leaders are going to be start, start to making laws about environmental protection. And there's probably going to be big battles between the business people and the politicians, unless the politicians are completely bribed. <laughs> like the Republicans in the US. But anyway, um, I think the art of legislation, there are going to be issues like you could make a law, but the law allows the rich. The rich are not nearly as negatively impacted by it as the poor. So that's a big problem. To what extent are environmental laws increasing the gap between the rich and the poor, right? That's environmental justice issues. And we'll talk about that in at least one class and then you go find yourself an article about it. Um, how to distribute, right? The benefits of, of exploitation of nature and then the costs. Usually the wealthy, you know, create all the pollution but suffer the least from that. And then how much, what should the punishments be? How severe should they be? Should the rich be fined, right? And, and big time fined, right? Big fines. Um, so those issues are gonna come up again and again in your lifetime. So uh, we'll cover that in class a little bit. Um, my main point here is that you can scroll through this whole list and there's whole lots of stuff and then how much math education, STEM education is really implicitly um, teaching people to go exploit nature more because that's where the jobs are or implicitly or explicitly teaching them green engineering or what, right? Those are big issues. Um, 
All right, then we have the UN Declaration. Now you can think more about um, how is your country influenced by the United Nations? Did the UN come in? The UN has major climate issues. They, the best scientists, best climate scientists work on a panel at the UN. Um, they make recommendations, but how much clout do those recommendations have and how much money do they have to be able to support their recommendations? You can study whether the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank or some other NGO, Brock, is contributing serious money to developing green energy, green products. Um, so uh, you can, um, so if you could think of anything just off the top of your head that the UN is involved in, in your country, you can write that down. Um, and then the other part of that was, I said that um, even though the UN's official declaration is about rights, so now you should be under, understand why I'm a bit, I, I want you also to know that when they actually measure, they measure capabilities, why? because capability sort of brings you back to Aristotle. And also it includes the um, being able to live with concern for and in relation to animal, plants and the world of nature, right? So it includes that. But then that, I mean, the irony of it all is that the very last thing is about holding property, right? property rights, <laughs> whereas in the history of Western colonialism and uh, the Western paradigm, property rights was number one, <laughs> the exploitation of nature for human well-being. That was, that was the, you know, the main driving force of the whole revolution. And on this document, that's the last thing on the list. So the UN focuses on quality of life, not just increasing the gross domestic product, right? Making the economy bigger. It has to be distributed. It has to be sustainable, those things. So, um, and now that you know Locke's view of rights, that's why I wanted to give you a, you know, two views of what the UN is doing, because the UN does use the language of rights, but they're definitely not in favor of the original use of the idea of property rights. So when the UN says property rights, they really mean something different. It has to be sustainable. Um, so why don't I'll give you a minute if you can think of something uh, in your country where the UN, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, um, an NGO, Brock, has gotten involved and tried to um, beef up, you know, your green economy. If you can't think of anything, if you don't know anything, it's another minute or two to jot down notes on some of the other things. So I'll just give you a couple more minutes on this class and then we'll move to the next class. Um, Dr. Beck? Yes? May you check my chat? I sent you something Oops. asking you a question. Okay, sure. Let's see. Oh, well, when it's, when it's sharing, I don't think I even see that I have. Oh, is it up here? Okay. Okay. I don't I don't see that the chat shows up. Okay. All right. Um let's see. Oh, well, it's up to you, Rossi, really. Um no, you don't have to. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, that's not a problem. 
Um, okay. Actually, I didn't even finish reading it. I just read that much, so I hope that's okay. Uh, I'll read the rest of it when I get to it. Um, all right. I mean, the reason I told Rossi that is she handed in all the posts and they're longer than usual. She handed in her paper. So it's not like special favors or anything. Um, all right. So let's go to the next one. Um, all right. So let's, the first issue was Galileo and Bacon. And Galileo talked about the two worlds, two world systems. And the main point of that reading, and I didn't even assign it to you, but the main point was that the way the Western world set this up was that science was over here and religion was over there. And the Catholic church was threatened by modern science. And so they silenced Galileo and scientists were perceived as enemies, right? As atheists. Um, so I do want you to write down, just think about to what extent do people in your country think that science is anti-religion and religion is anti-science? And this is a completely open question, you know? I would imagine each of you, you know, the countries are different, but also each of you is positioned in your country in a different way. So you might say, well, in my little subculture, it wasn't a problem, but in general, it's a problem or whatever. Um, so I'll just give you a minute to a couple minutes. What's the relation between science and religion? in people's minds or in the culture, in how the politicians speak to appeal to people. Okay, and the second part of this reading was Francis Bacon. Human knowledge, this is number two, human knowledge and human power meet in one. For where the cause is not known, which is nature is the cause, the effect cannot be produced. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed, right? So first you have to obey nature, understand it. Then you turn around and command it, right? Uh, okay. So the purpose of knowledge is power. To what extent did, is your country and your economy based on that view? To what extent does scientific knowledge in the school system, STEM or whatever, science, to what extent is it assumed that that knowledge will be used to exploit nature to create products, right? To create um, a, a national economy, to increase the size of the economy in your countries. That's the next question. Professor, can you repeat it? Okay. So Bacon was about the purpose of scientific knowledge is power. Okay. The reason we study nature, science, is to control it. So to what extent in your country, when you're going through high school, 
and how much value is placed on science education? And is the value placed there so that you can go create uh, new products, right? Exploit nature for human well being in your country to grow your economy in some way that's not sustainable or that you don't even think about sustainability. Does that help, Sristi? Thank you, Professor. Sure. Okay, there was something else in bacon, the idols. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'll list the four idols and then I'll ask you to write down. Do you think this is true about people, right? So the idol of the tribe is that um, because we belong to a certain species, we just get caught, we get locked into our own experience and what we know, what we see, and we're so ignorant of anything outside of our own, our own personal five senses, right? So there's an the idol of each person's experience. There's the idol of the, I got to make, um, Uh, let's see, idols. Okay, there's four of them. Okay, one, another one of them. So there's the idol of, you know, your own ignorance. Then there's the idol of the species. So humankind in general is limited in their understanding. So to what extent do we not know what the future will bring about with climate change, right? Because we just don't have that knowledge or we don't have it yet. Um, the thing that's amazing is that we do have very complex computers and they have predicted a lot of what is happening. It's just that no one was listening. <laughs> but, but, some of these decisions, some of the articles you read, people will say, well, we can't limit ourselves now because somebody's afraid that something might happen because we can't know that. And so all we know is that people will lose jobs today because somebody's worried about something in 20 years from now, right? So there is that problem of uh, the species, the limits of human knowledge, especially at any particular time. Then there's the problem of the idol of the marketplace. To what extent do people go down to the marketplace or they talk to other people and they believe whatever they hear without, you know, getting, finding out what the experts are saying without stepping back? They just listen to whatever, that, that would be Facebook, right? Is that a problem? That would be the idol of the marketplace. And then the idol of the theater is um, these different theological and philosophical systems, right? Like uh, utilitarianism is one theater performance and Kant's dualism is another, right? These different worldviews, those are the idols of the theater. 
So to what extent do people in your experience just decide they're going to associate with one worldview? I'm going to be a utilitarian. I'm going to apply everything in the world to this principle. And uh, it just blinds them to the truth. So I'll just give you a minute. Do you think these idols, these limitations, these types of ignorance are a problem? And are they a problem in relation to environmental problems? Okay, then here's another biggie, which I really think should be in your first paper. This was John Locke's view of property and property rights. God gave us the world in common, and we, if we work it up and give it value, that's what God wants. When God gave the world in common, he commanded man to work. And you need to work to survive. This is the book of Genesis that we're reading for today. Um, so God and his reason commanded man to subdue the earth. Oh, right? Yes. So that's the book of Genesis. That was what Lynn White was talking about. That's why he's saying Christianity is to blame, to improve it for the benefit of life. And in doing so, he expended something of his own, his labor. So he's obeying the command of God. He tilled and sowed any part of the earth's surface, exploited nature. And this was what God wants, the appropriation of the um, land. Okay. So that's, that's important, really important. And then... The next step was that that notion of rights was, um, okay, was applied to all aspects of the culture. Um, it was applied to social rights, okay, that it was applied to government, three branches of government, people have a right to vote a right to be represented by officials, all this stuff, right to free speech. The thing is Locke didn't want money because then money would stick to money and somebody would get rich and then it would get corrupted. So if there's a huge gap huh, between the rich and the poor, I don't know where this, the rest of this um, outline went. There's four pages of it. <laughs> anyway, if hopefully you'll, you'll get it, you'll be able to see the rest of it. Oh, here we go. Oh, all right. So um, the main thing with Locke, is that the weakness was when money sticks to money. Because you can say everybody has a right to education, but if some people are rich and some people are poor, they're never gonna get that right, right? The society isn't gonna be structured in a way that gives them a good education or good health care, Or um, in, the, in the case of the US especially, we have news that's driven by profits. And so Fox News, it's just the people just lie without any qualms because, and they, they do say this, they've been quoted saying this. Well, we just give people what they want, right? We have a product. We're a capitalist system, you know, supply demand. If the people demand to be lied to, we will supply the lies, right? 
because we want to be successful and we're good capitalists. <laughs> yeah, and obviously uh, climate change is a hoax. Everybody knows that. Everybody who listens to Fox News knows that. Um, so that's a big problem. It's a problem when the concept of rights and property rights um, gets corrupted by money. So I'll stop for a minute. Does that happen in your country? Do you have what looks like a democracy and the politicians say you have a right to vote, you have, we have, you have these rights, but what's actually going on is rich folk control so much of all aspects of the culture. Okay, so what I'm asking you to do, I mean, basically the paradigm there, the idea is here are the ideas when people were very optimistic, they believed in this, they thought it would lead to human prosperity and democracy, okay? What we read for today was about democracy and at approximately the same time when democracy hit Europe, the science and technology came at about the same time because the further opening up, especially in America, people came for opportunity and then they really cut down the trees, right? They really got wealthy by taming the frontier, right? So they were the model that everybody looked to. Um, so that's what the reading by Moncrief is about for today. Okay, so Foreman, you have a question? No. Okay. Okay. Then the third one um, was, was Kant, and he had that view of um, pure reason, right? So when reason looks to the natural world, it makes a system of laws. When reason, he also believed that it's reasonable to believe in God, but this is not the same kind of notion of God as Aristotle or Locke, right? Um, so Bacon and Locke, all right, so the key here is that um, Kant does not think there's animosity between belief in God and reason. He just thinks they're detached. And he doesn't see belief in God as having any relationship to respect for the natural world, <laughs> right? So Kant's view is, is like today, an engineer, artificial intelligence, computer science, that sort of super logical way of thinking that can completely detach you from the natural world. So he has his arguments about free will and all that wonderful stuff. But the key here for, for ethics, for environmental ethics, is that his method is to detach yourself from your animal nature, from your emotions, from your impulses, from your pleasures and pains, and just act uh, on the basis of reason. So for today, we did have 
one of the articles talked about dualism, right? So this split between reason and nature within our psyche led to this culture of skyscrapers and um, all sorts of engineering, bridges, roads, um, all the things that we, people in their um, offices make these little maps and then exploit nature to build all these incredible structures, but they're not sustainable. And it was not even considered an issue. So what goes along with that is you develop the habit of acting only on the basis of reason. And so you wouldn't have empathy with animals, okay? So in his relation to animals, we don't have any duties to animals. Reason, human reason is of infinite worth. But the physical world, including plants and animals, is not of infinite worth. And we don't have any duties. So if we need animals for food or for clothing or shelter, that's okay. That's, that's fine. He has no problem with that. The only reason to not to treat animals brutally is because it might lead you to treating animals, people, brutally. Okay, so I'm going to stop and you think of examples of people who you know think like that or if, if your society is structured that way, even if people don't think like that, it's just become so embedded in the culture that you respect engineers that make higher and higher skyscrapers or, you know, bigger and bigger bridges or, you know, some other concrete um, steel and concrete sort of constructions and plowing over the earth, right? So either that or people who really don't think animals have any rights, right? They think it's perfectly fine for animals to be used for any sort of experimental use that would help humans live better lives. Do you think, not necessarily, I mean, you could say, do you agree or not, but the point here is, whatever your opinion, do you think it's influenced your culture that Western colonialism has colonized the minds of your people also? All right, so I'm going to be a good teacher and give you a break. All right, so take 10, guys, all right? Thank you, Professor. Of course. And if you want to sit here and furiously write more so you get a better grade, fine. You want to take a break? Fine. No problem. All right.
I don't know if people are back or not. Um, oh my gosh, I left the recording on. All right, so when you listen to it, I'll have to say to the students, there's a seven minute break in the middle of the recording. Okay. All right, so the next thing we studied was utilitarianism. It's exactly the opposite of Kant. Kant said, do not pay any attention to your pleasures or pains or the consequences of your actions. Zero, only think of what reason commands. All right, the other guys, and they're simultaneous, right? They don't get along with each other very well. Okay, so Bentham says um, uh, the origin of utilitarianism was science and scientific method. So they want a scientific foundation, whoops, for culture. Um, Let's see, here we go. So this was the scientific revolution, empiricism, facts. What are the facts? The facts are everybody seeks happiness. Everybody interp interprets happiness to mean pleasure and the absence of pain. People are blank slates. They're the products of genetics and conditioning, mostly conditioning. The only reason people, when people grow up in societies with inequality, it's a corrupting influence. So the reason why we have greed and sloth and lust and gluttony and envy and pride, the reason we have all those sins 
is because of social structures and social conditioning. So if we get rid of all those institutions and we recondition people, we can get rid of all those vices. We can condition people to be moderate and just and virtuous. Um, the key to equality and justice is education. Children can be socially engineered to be good. All right. So the greatest happiness principle, right? And what does this have? So for this class, what does this mean for environmental protection? So people, if you agree that, yeah, happiness, pleasure, pain, it did not include the consequences, right, of polluting today on the future at all. That was not remotely considered. And the problem is it still isn't, right? If you tell somebody, well, just seek your own happiness, they are not likely to say, oh yeah, I'll use less water in the shower and I'll turn on the air conditioning and I'll walk instead of driving. And you know, they're <laughs> and then I'll be happy. They don't associate that, even though it becomes more and more evident, but they, you know, what they really need to think about is what about your children's happiness, right? The consequences for your children and your grandchildren. So it does have consequences, but when you just tell people to seek pleasure and happiness, uh, yeah, not very many people even today associate those. So the question here is, you personally, do you think your conscience is just a bunch of associations? So John Stuart Mill would say, the reason why people use fossil fuels is that they've grown up using fossil fuels without any connection between using it and bad, you know, some concept of good and bad. It was just assumed to be good. And so conscience, <laughs> your idea of good and evil is just based on your conditioning. Um, so, all right. What do you think? Do you think that your conscience is just completely uh, the result of social conditioning? Do you agree with that? Do you think, um, have you, has your idea of happiness, pleasure and pain been corrupted by the West? Do you seek happiness, pleasure and pain and either use more fossil fuels or just don't even think about it? It's not part of how you calculate that. Because um, when you go online and you order stuff, right? Or you find out what's for sale and you go to the nearest mall and you buy it, that's fossil fuel, uh, that's carbon footprint, but that's very likely that's what you associate with happiness, pleasure, and pain. But that's John Locke, right? That's corporation. That's someone making money off of you. So do you think your mind, your idea of happiness, your idea pleasures and pains have been colonized by Western capitalism? Or if not yours, people around you or your country? And where do you wanna go moving forward? Where do you want to take yourself? Where do you want to take your culture, your social circles? Where do you want to take your country?
Okay, and I will say one other thing that's interesting, that Mill thought there were higher pleasures, pleasures of the intellect, of feelings and the arts, imagination, and the feeling would be empathy with other people, but nowhere is one of the higher pleasures the pleasure of behaving in a way that's sustainable, right? It's absolutely not there. So where Bentham says, I can play pushpin or checkers, I can do anything I want, so long as I'm not hurting anybody else. And Mill says, no, there are these higher pleasures. Neither of them care about sustainability. Both of them assume unending, unlimited exploitation of natural resources. All right, then when Mill talks about why people prefer lower pleasures, he says, because they haven't had enough opportunity for education. But again, nowhere is there sustainable versus unsustainable. Even, and today, that's a big problem because there are wealthy people who are critical of people with a carbon footprint, but a lot of those people can't afford to have cars that are, you know, hybrid cars, lower carbon emission. Poor people have cars in my country that the exhaust, right, the, the, the system the exhaust pipe, and it it's the worst, right? It emits the most um, junk into the air, but that's just because the cars are cheap and that's all they can afford. So there is that problem of blaming the poor. Um, but in general, the rich use a lot more fossil fuels than the poor, and they don't pay the price for it. So, so you could use utilitarianism to end up with sustainability, but highly unlikely. You have to know where you're going. And very few, nobody really uses utility when they're trying to encourage sustainability. Um, all right, so then Bentham had that extensive outline about pleasures and pains. Um, but again, it had nothing to do with sustainability. There's the physical pain, but the problem is with environmental problems, the pains are not immediate enough. Um, they're, they're becoming immediate, immediate in Bangladesh with the flooding and the cyclones, but still people will fall back into their old habits. Um, so that's been tough. And then the politicians don't punish people, right? You don't get put in jail or prison or fined for polluting. There's moral, you don't get, you know, you don't lose social status. You tend to gain social status if you get rich, which usually means fossil fuels. And then religious people, in my country anyway, they don't, there aren't very many preachers who tell you you'll go to hell if you pollute the earth. Um, my father did think that stewardship of the earth was really important. He wasn't telling people they're going to hell, but he definitely thought, 55 years ago that a religious person has to want to live sustainably. But not most, most preachers in my country know. 
and then you can think, okay? Think about in your country. So just give you a minute, a couple minutes to write down. Do people suffer um, from, do they lose status or respect in their social circles if they live a high carbon lifestyle? Do they get fined, right, or put in jail? Do they get punished politically for high carbon lifestyle? Or do the religious leaders uh, promote sustainability and condemn um, high carbon lifestyles? So are pleasure and pain being used to promote sustainability according to Bentham's calculation of how you have to do it. Okay, and then while you're writing, I'll go down to this calculus, right? When people are calculating pleasures and pains, the in, to each individual, how intense it is, how long lasting it is, how certain it is, how immediate or remote. So climate change, right? The really negative impacts are not certain, they can't be measured in an absolute term. They can't, the intensity, the duration, it's, it's imprecise. And then remoteness, right? It gets more intense the farther into the future, but that's not how people usually calculate the longer term effects. Um, and then Let's see, the property of the act. The act itself of having to use less fossil fuel usually isn't, I mean, it's not super painful, but people are not convinced about future consequences because they can't envision any kind of physical pleasure or pain from using, you know, eating meat, for example. They just can't think that way. Okay. So um, just one more comment about, do you think this idea of calculating pleasures and pains can be used to promote sustainability or do you think it's just too vague, too far into the future? There has to be some other way to convince people. Okay, then the next thing is not only that, but if you tell people um, the only reason someone can interfere in your life is because they're being harmed, right? To prevent their being harmed. You can't interfere in anybody's life because to protect a person from themselves, right? The only freedom, okay, that deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way, so long as we don't try to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts. All right, if you tell people that, are they going to instantly think that I'm free to live a sustainable lifestyle? Or are they gonna go, I'm free 
to do whatever I want with my land, as long as I give it value. I'm free to buy whatever products I want. I don't want the government telling me what products to buy. That's tyranny, right? That's interfering with my freedom. Um, I should be able to do, right? Have whatever pleasures I want in my leisure time. I should be able to spend my money however I want. I worked hard. I created a product. There was a demand for it. People bought it. I made my money. I'm free to buy whatever I want. Keep the government out of my life, right? Okay, is that gonna help us moving forward to create a sustainable future? So I, I want you to jot down, I want you to realize how powerful this is in the minds of Americans, especially. Then I want you to think, is that how people in my country think? Have their minds been colonized? All right, so here's the, the next question. Can you understand why Americans refuse to wear masks and refuse to get vaccinated? Because they say, keep the government out of my life, right? I'm not hurting anybody. I'm free to do what I want. Can you understand it? Then the next question is, are people in your country, do they think like that or not, right? When it comes to masks, are they, I think in a number of your countries, they're not wearing masks. Is that because they don't feel like it? Or in America, it's the principle of the thing. The government's trying to control my breathing. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, obviously you're not thinking about other people's pleasures and pains and happiness, except in their minds. Sure, I'm thinking of other people's happiness. They shouldn't have to wear a mask either. Think of all the pain of making everybody wear a mask. So they don't think about, what about the hospital workers who get exposed to COVID? What about the people who die? What about, well, there aren't very many of them, right? That's the answer. You know, if you calculate how many people actually get COVID, it's a very small percentage compared to all the pain and unhappiness when you make everybody wear a mask, right? There's 330 million people in this world, in this country. If everybody wears, has to wear a mask, the pain of wearing a mask is greater than the pain of having 500,000 people die. And people said that. It's worth it. They calculated. Does that happen in your countries? Do people think like that?
And then when it comes to the vaccine, I want you to think about in your country, first of all, do people want to get the vaccine? Or are there certain people based on religion that, you know, religion versus science? So are there people in your country that say it's God's will if we get, if we die or not? We're not supposed to try and use science or I shouldn't have to use, get a vaccine because the politicians are too powerful or do they want to get a vaccine? Do the religious leaders tell them they should get a vaccine? Um, I'm curious about that. Do you know, you know, it seems like you probably know. Do people in your countries think of getting a vaccine as inhibiting their freedom and their happiness? All right, so then what about this issue? We sh everyone should be able to act on their beliefs, right? Don't repress any beliefs because we can, um, someone can come across with along with a contrary belief and then you have to render an account of your belief. You have to explain why you're believing it. And then you develop a higher level of reasoning, right? Practical wisdom. If you just allow everyone to have whatever opinion, eventually people will develop good judgment. Wrong opinions gradually yield. Is that true? With Facebook and social media, do you think people you know, we'll believe some kind of weird theories for a while, but eventually they'll wake up? Or do you think we could end up destroying every democracy in the world because people are afraid and they believe any conspiracy theory and Fox News and other news sources make tons of money on that and they don't care. So question is, do you think Mill is right? In the long run, the truth will come out? Or do you think Mill was too optimistic and he was really naive and Facebook, right? Zuckerberg was just hesitated to limit all the false lies going on before the election because he didn't want to limit freedom. <laughs> and then Twitter, you know, President, former President Trump got kicked out of Twitter. I think you probably know that. Oh, that censorship, oh, it's terrible, okay? <laughs> because somebody thought, you know what? This isn't working, this theory that people will eventually become thoughtful. It's not working in my country. And so I'm asking you, in your countries, what is happening or what do you anticipate? could happen. Do you think your people will be able to eventually become critical thinkers at just a basic level so they can't get manipulated by really wicked 
um, political leaders that want to be tyrants? Or do you think there's a danger in everyone having Facebook and not having an education for knowing how to think critically about what they're seeing on Facebook or social media? All right. Okay, so then when it comes to animal rights, sorry, um, I mean, these issues are all so interconnected, right? So Peter Singer emphasizes empathy. If you remember, John Stuart Mill wanted to base a whole society on empathy with fellow, with people in our species. Well, Singer just said, wait a sec, that's speciesism. We favor our species, but there's no reason to do that because if it's empathy, then what you empathize with is that people, that people are, excuse me, capable of pleasure and pain and animals are capable of pleasure and pain. They're sentient creatures, right? They're capable of pleasure and pain. So they should be given rights also, because that's the basis of human rights, is capacity for pleasure and pain. So this has happened before. We have these liberation movements. We used to think, you know, race, people from Africa were not as fully human or women or rights, gay. I mean, there's this constant um, marginalizing or, you know, false lies about other people. And then when you realize, oh, nope, they're equal in terms of sentience, which is the foundation for rights. Okay, and so now the next step is animals. Um, the claim to equality, it doesn't depend on intelligence, any of that stuff when you're applying to human. So, um, so it, shouldn't, it should apply to animals also. Um, yeah, over here, Bentham, and he talks about Bentham. And Bentham says that suffering, capacity for suffering is what gives people equal right to consideration. Um, and so, um, animals should also have that, so. Okay, do you agree with, do you agree that the capacity to suffer is what should govern the laws and the laws should protect unnecessary suffering of any creature that has the capacity for pleasure and pain. Do you think the laws, the legal system should protect based on the capacity to suffer? Professor? Yeah? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, okay. so one question. Uh, can you tell me which uh, reading we are at right now? Which this Bentham. So this is utilitarianism? Yes. Um, so we, we just have, what, we're almost there. We're almost caught up. We still have Karl Marx. Does that answer your question or do you want a more specific? Uh, no, and I think that's okay. Sorry, I was just, just disconnected for 15 minutes. So oh. I just came oh. back. So I'm not yeah. sure which document we are in. 
Right. It's so hard. I'm so sorry that you all get disconnected. Um, that's another reason I'm doing this today. At least it'll be on, you know, the YouTube. There'll be this one continuous strain stream, you know, of what I was trying to get at. So. Um, yeah. I took a professor. I um, I, uh, uh, I have an idea now. Okay. It's this one. Um, um, so that was for class on June 2nd. So it's okay. this one with all the. Six, yes, Professor, I've got it. Thank you. Okay, sure. All right. So that was the main issue there. And then you can reflect on, you can write on for your paper, right? You're writing on my environmental ethic. And you could, if you want to, just compare Kant's view of our duties toward animals as opposed to Singer's view. And you could disagree with both of them if you want to, or you know, use the animal's example to show in general, if you like Kant's view on animals in general, you like his view of reason, or if you don't like his view of animals in general, you don't like his view of reason, right? Uh, well, that's one possibility for the paper, but obviously there are many possibilities. And as you're writing your notes on all of this, something might come to mind where you're thinking, that's what I would wanna write my paper on. The other thing I hope comes to mind is that that's what I want to expand for my post on for that day. Okay. So then Karl Marx. Now, you guys, you've got, I can't believe you're not going to quote from Karl Marx because Marx says these people can talk about rights and freedom and all this garbage. It's about money. That's what it's really about, right? So, so the Communist Manifesto, right? Everything is really the modern bourgeoisie, right? Has trashed everything. And now our epic has, all it is is the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. And they've gone all over the world. The markets keep growing and growing and industry and technology they keep revolutionizing production. They keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, and the politicians are just puppets of the, of the rich bourgeoisie business people. Um, and it has resolved personal worth into exchange value. Everything's about money. There's only one real freedom, free trade, right? which really means exploitation veiled by religious and political illusions, right? So, oh, this is God's will, right? That's a religious illusion. Or this is freedom, equality, progress, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. And Mark says, it's an illusion. It's all about money, right? It's naked exploitation of natural resources and human resources. First at home, then abroad, then all over the world. This is reality. Um, they can't exist they, without constantly revolutionizing, which obviously has happened, right? You go from science to industry to machinery to technology, to, you know, these waves and waves, the iPhone 10 or whatever it is, just this constant having to get better and better in order to get rich. In a capitalist society, you have to grow or you die, right? 
Um, all relationships between people have changed. That's why I'm here, right? Here we are on Zoom. Hey guys, this is a particular example. All our relationships have changed based on technology uh, created by the bourgeoisie, motivated by money. Hello. <laughs> um, let's. Oh, but is yeah. Go ahead. But I, I mean, is it really possible to like uh, stop exploitation? Like, no, I think no matter how how or what our social so societal structure is, I mean, there's always going to be people who are more powerful than the others, and there's always going to be a chance of exploitation of the weak. So, no, that's true. It's just that. Do you want Bangladesh to actually do you, we're going to read stuff where where there are Westerners who say they just have to die off. That's just the reality. Uh, the the you poor guys. people. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's where it's going. <laughs> so, I mean, my view is that. Of course, but it's going to keep on going, right? So if people who are in the bottom line right now, they die off, then the, the next step will come. There will be some other people who are in the, who comes down to the bottom line. And then it's just gonna keep on going, right? Well, I mean, that, the, the thing is, the reason AUW exists is because in the proposal, they said, Okay, here's one way to stop stop this spiral downward, right? Here's one, educate women. They won't have as many kids. That's how you prevent overpopulation. So, you know, if you want to be really pessimistic about it, the truth is AUW shouldn't exist if pessimism is the answer. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, Professor. I mean, it, <laughs> we're all part of the system. Um, yeah. And I, uh, yes, I get discouraged. I've known about it for 55 years, right? But every day I wake up and I think, well, I mean, if I don't try to get on the right side of, of you know, trying to stop this terrible um, movement, well, you know, I should just kill myself, right? I'm going to be using fossil fuels. So either I'm going to try to help or I'm going to, there's nobody's neutral in this. Does that make sense? Yes, Professor, absolutely. No, yeah, I, right. I, I mean, I did. I got very depressed in high school like Greta Thunberg did. Uh, but, you know, my answer was, okay, get up in the morning, do something rather than nothing, right? Um, and eventually, I can teach environmental ethics, which is nice. And I don't blame you for getting discouraged. It's just that the irony is, if you guys give up, <laughs> you know, us guys in the US will go, yeah, okay, they gave up. So we're going to let them drown or let them Free, freeze or let them burn, you know? Um, and I, I don't think you really want Westerners to just sort of let your whole country sort of die off, right? But it's hard, it's, you know, it is this huge, and that's why, okay, the other thing I wanted to point out is that should help you understand why there are Marxist movements and there have been Marxist parties and movements, I think in all of your countries, or at least a lot in that area, because the, this is how they're thinking, right? And that's very compelling thinking. Um, the other thing is intellectual production like people like me who come in and talk about these, you know, Aristotelian virtues or international, that's another tool, you know, for capitalists to get, get the trust of these developing countries. <laughs> you can use people better as long as they're, you know, they're compliant with. Um, so, 
So capitalists can make use of the intellectual community. Um, we can teach uh, people in developing countries science and technology just enough so that they have enough engineers to build the, the bridges to get the goods that we that we buy, right? I mean, okay, so I want to make money exploiting rubber in Papua. All right. So Indonesians can teach their people enough engineering to build the road. So I don't have to come in there and build the road, but then I'll write a contract where I get all the minerals, <laughs> right? I get a huge profit from the forests and the minerals, uh, but I did let them have a few engineers to build the road. It saved me money. <laughs> um, anyway, okay. So, and then this international culture, right? Common humanity that can also be used as a tool to get developing countries to think that the West actually cares about them. Um, the, the bourgeoisie has caused the urbanization, right? It's created enormous cities. That's a big issue. Um, political centralization. Uh, let's see. And now it's in this problem of overproduction, which is true in Europe and America, there people are thinking about a guaranteed income because there aren't any jobs, because robots do everything or everything's got so efficient, there's nobody, there's no jobs for people to do. And so we do have the problem of overproduction, the epidemic. So how are we gonna deal with that? Um, all right, wage labor. Here's another interesting issue that the, the energy you put into making it, making something, everybody on the, the line, whatever, um, the, the dress, whatever, it, the, it um, maybe costs $20, but the workers total together only make about $10 off of that. The capitalist owner uh, gains way more than the worker for the money, for the energy. So they never get the value of their labor back, right? So when John Stuart Mill says, I worked hard, I created, you know, uh, wealth and I deserve the fruit of my labor, uh, Karl Marx says, if you're a worker in a factory, you never get the fruit of your labor because the owner takes it, takes way more than his share. Like he didn't even work to make it. He made the factory, okay. But he always says he has to have extra capital to invest in the next product or the next factory, right? So the worker never gets back the value of his work. Um, Okay, so, all right, here's the first issue. Do you think Karl Marx has a good um, understanding of capitalism and the problems of capitalism? That's a very different question than his idea of the solution. <laughs> so let's just start with the problem. Are there things that Karl Marx says about capitalism, about a free market, free trade that you think are true and they apply in your country? Yes. <laughs> Good. And um, I would love to have, you know, this conversation. But right now, I want you to just write down your answers. And in the next class, you can meet in groups. And I just hope by then, you know, you'll all have lots to say to each other. Does that make sense? 
Yes, Professor. I hope so. And then I, I just wanted to do one class where all the pieces get put together and we don't stop and just pick a little part of it, so. So your, your post about Marx can have plenty of examples of how this relates to your country. And then your first paper could, if you want it to. But look what he says, it's interesting here. The bourgeoisie during its rule of scarcely one century has created more massive and colossal productive forces than all the preceding generations. Well, folks, what about since then, right? Since then, I think that was 18 something, right? It's another 150 years later. Um, then he also points out the subjection of nature's forces to man machinery, the application of chemistry, but he doesn't criticize that. He doesn't talk about sustainability. And Marxist countries in Europe anyway, really had no environmental laws. They were way behind the, the West, um, Europe and the US because it just wasn't included in the mindset. Um, okay, then what about Marx's solution to the problem? is abolishing private property <laughs> the solution to the problem of capitalism. If we abolish private property and governments run, government sells you every product you buy, will we then have a sustainable economy? Will the other thing he said is, if the workers take over, they will not be power hungry. <laughs> they will redistribute because they have empathy with other workers. Is that true? <laughs> okay, so it's very optimistic, right? Marx was too optimistic, but so was John Stuart Mill, right? They both were super optimistic. Free and open society, mature adults, blah, blah. Um, no private property. Everybody shares with everybody. No greed, no problems. <laughs> um, so then um, Gorbachev, when, when the USSR, when the wall came down, he didn't say Marxism is dead. He said, we have to adapt it because capitalism has created a new layer, a new kind of production, which is technology. And that requires a lot of education. And so now we're gonna to have to have this different levels of education. The society is gonna be complex. We can't just trade off jobs. So we have to adapt Marxism. That was his, that was Gorbachev's claim, okay? Um, and nowadays we have Putin. He, he, you know, it appears to be a republic right, the Russian Republic, but really about 20 people own, I don't know, 90% of the economy. <laughs> and he, you know, there isn't a free press and there aren't free elections and all that stuff. There's a huge centralization of power and wealth. So it didn't work out the way Marx 
uh, Marx's idea of the solution was bad. His idea of the problem was, um, was good, I think, but all right. So um, what did I want? I guess, so, oh yeah, this one, just reminding you of what the attitude of the British colonialist, but it's just colonialism in general, is that the British uh, army officer said, I've traveled throughout India and no one's a beggar or a thief. There's such wealth, such high moral values, people of such caliber. I never thought we, we will never be able to conquer this country unless we break the backbone which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. So we have to replace the ancient educational system and the culture. So if, if Indians think that all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, their native culture. They will become what we want them to be, a truly dominated nation. Now. Do you think this happened in your country, right? Did, did Western colonialism cause people in your culture to break and to give it all up and try to be Western? And has that benefited you? And I think that's a complex question especially from a woman's point of view, <laughs> right? Because the West introduced women's equality, right? And women's rights. So I think as a woman, you're gonna have to be awful conflicted about this, right? Um, okay. So that if you wanna use that in your paper, either the paper you're writing this week or your final paper, you can use that. And then finally, I'll, I'm gonna spend a few more minutes on this and then we'll take another break and then we'll go to the reading for today. So here's the summary of the legacy of the West. Francis Bacon, um, Purpose of knowledge is power. The new sciences. Um, Bacon. The new social sciences. This is um, social sciences, especially Mill and Bentham. How to manipulate people with ple through pleasure and pain. Um, how to change human nature permanently. Let's see, the doctrine of human rights, John Locke, property, and then applying it in the world today and how it gets corrupt, right? How it's applied in the US. You don't have to read that if you want to, I don't care. Marx's criticism of Locke, and um, the UN, right? Applying lock. Okay, so then you have the United Nations and then you have neoliberalism, which is minimal government. Okay, and again, you don't have to talk about that, but everything you do, you should think, how does this relate to my country, right? Or to me or to my social circle, my family, or something like that. So I'll give you 10 minutes. You can spend it writing. You can spend it getting up and stretching or eating or whatever. But we'll get back together at 11.15. And then we'll talk about these readings related to Christianity. OK, guys, take a break. Um, 
I'm going to get up for a minute and I'll probably just walk around the room. But if anybody wants my attention, uh, you know, if you just speak, I'll, I'll hear you after a minute. I'm going to take a minute. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So this is a paper by a student that applies the concepts we've talked about to her particular country. And so she starts out quoting Locke. If you remember, Locke thought everyone, everyone has a natural right to life, liberty, health, and possessions. But he wanted a barter system. And he said, uh-oh, when, when people invented money, then it got money starts sticking to money and it's not going to work. So she starts out with that quote, men came to want more than they needed and then they invented money and this changed the intrinsic value of things, right? So during Western colonialism, developed countries went to third world countries to exert their power and extract their resources. Cambodia was one of those countries. And then, you know, fill in the name of your country and see if it works. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. It's up to you. Um, it was a target for raw materials and a marketplace for the Western capitalists. Um, they did that for decades. And therefore, the Cambodian citizens' individual rights were ignored. And so the essay talks about how that happened. And even today, they say they're a democracy. They say they have free elections and free speech and free trade, but really it's the rule of the rich. Just like Marx says, the politicians are the puppets of the rich or they are the rich. Um, anyway, so then she starts with the history of her country originally they asked the French to come to protect them against their neighbors, but once the French got there, they controlled Cambodian foreign and trade relationships, right? They forced the king to sign a treaty, making it a French colony. Um, and later on, they started exploiting them economically. So once they got there, they looked, wow, this place as fertile, right? This place has got natural resources. This is not such a backward place. Again, this is straight out of Karl Marx, right? Rice, pepper, and rubber. So they investors came to exploit the land for products that French people needed or wanted, right? Uh, the economy boomed as French investors, you right? Uh, built rubber plantations, the French automobile industry, this doesn't benefit Cambodians, right? Um, and then they utilize the land for corn and, and cotton. And John Locke's philosophy justifies this, right? The life support provisions produced by one acre are 10 times more than what would come from an acre of equally rich land that was held in common and not cultivated like the Native Americans. That's why the Americans were justified in pushing Native Americans off their land or killing them if they resisted. Because you have to remember, it's God's will. <laughs> Go back and read John Locke, like God's will, right? Since Cambodians didn't give these fertile lands market value, it was only right for the French to do it. Then they recruited immigrants to fish in the lakes and allowed the Chinese to expand commerce. So Cambodian soil was more beneficial to the French, the immigrants, and the Chinese since these other people knew how to extract um, the uses and make products that sold in the marketplace. Okay, so the influence didn't just stay in the plantations, but expanded. This is the Achilles heel. So that was that outline that I couldn't open up for some reason. Um, because uh, your place in the economic structure is the divider of privilege and opportunity. 
So the strongest tool for maintaining the gap between the rich and the poor is education. Is that true in your country, right? During their rule, the French should have brought democracy by providing adequate education for everyone, because if everyone had the same level of education, they could use their knowledge and technology to exploit their own nation's resources to create their own wealth, right? No. Okay, besides that, um, only a few French educational institutions were built and only the elites could send their kids there. The poor could only send them to the pagodas and the daughters stayed home. That meant the rich were able to maintain their wealth because they had the education necessarily to get the jobs, to make the products, to make the money, right? Um, so Locke addresses that unequal wealth leads to unequal rights. And then the outline uh, talks about these glaring inequalities, um, the right to education or health care. So free trade doesn't lead to that. Free trade leads to education, health care for the rich and nothing for the poor. Um, let's see. The wealthy sided with the French, right? Because the French protected them and justified their exploitation of their own people, okay? Let's see, then the French even forced the poor to pay higher taxes in order to have an even higher standard of living. That's, you know, just a power, just a, a, a way to maintain power, even another layer of it. So the theoretical democracy in Cambodia uh, still gets maintained. So now the Chinese um, are coming in. So Moncrief, this is the reading for today. And you didn't have to quote from Moncrief, but you can now that you're writing your papers later. But he just said it's the force of democracy, technology, urbanization, individual wealth. Um, that are related to the environmental crisis. So what I wanted you to see was that the same sort of forces that went on earlier in Cambodia with the French, and I would imagine in a lot of your countries earlier is going on now. It's just another iteration of it, just like Karl Marx says. So now, um, the, the Chinese want their One Belt, One Road initiative, and also the Chinese and the Americans are going to have this huge competition for green technology. Right now, they're still exploiting the earth, so they got control over a port, and they're, you know, mowing down hundreds of acres of land to build hotels and resorts, but eventually, um, and even now, they educate just a few Cambodians. And this will be true when it comes to green technology also. Only a few people will be able to have the privilege and the money to go to school to develop that knowledge. And money will stick to money. And then um, the poor will stay poor. Um, and no one will be able to complain because everyone knows that you need a green technology because the environmental problems will get worse and worse. So they'll be stuck, right? There will be another wave of pseudo-democracy um, where, you know, it appears to be free trade and free elections, but it's really not. Um, in conclusion, Cambodia has been going through a cycle of inauthentic democracy for a long time. Um, humans keep exploiting resources and the green revolution isn't going to change the power dynamics very much. Um, so um, again, that's, it's pessimistic. It's just realistic, but it doesn't mean people should not act, right? You just have to make really good choices about what you want to do with your life. And you shouldn't delude yourself or um, you shouldn't ignore it. 
you shouldn't deny it. You shouldn't have these, you know, be utopian about it, like Mill and Marx were utopian, right? They just thought the future was going to be uh, entirely different. We could reconstruct human nature. There are still people who think that, actually. Um, but um, anyway, so each of you, if you want to do some variation, at least that gives you one idea of a paradigm. Um, she didn't even, I don't, she didn't even quote Marx. You can quote Marx. That would be great. Um, anyway, so I think I'll just move on to the next, to the reading for today. Again, just to get, show you how the, all this stuff is interrelated. And the next class, we'll have more breakout sessions. So please come next time, ready to talk about something from this time, okay? Um, let's see, so back to this. Um, oh. Is this what I want? Yeah. Okay. So the first article was about the Genesis story. And the question here, uh, God created man in the image of himself, in the image of God. God blessed them. Male and female, he created them. Bless them, saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and conquer it. Well, that's a translation, right? Um, and you don't have to use the word conquer to translate that Hebrew word, plus the associations we have with that at this point in history is no way that's what they were thinking, right? Again, that was a time when the idea was there wasn't any limit. They weren't thinking in terms of limit. Obviously, this is way, way before John Stuart Mill. Um, be masters of the fish and all the living creatures. I give you the seed bearing plants and all the trees. This shall be your food. Um, um, all right, so that's Lynn White is saying what Lynn White, well, anyway, he emphasizes that. So Lynn White disagrees with Patrick Doval on what is actually going on in this quote, okay? Um, then after the fall, I assume most of you know about the fall because, okay, so God said, don't eat from the tree of good and evil. And they did. I don't know if you all know that story. And then he got punished, right? So he got punished because you listened. Yeah, it's all her fault too. Okay, you got it. <laughs> Adam, when, when Adam messed up, he took it like a man. He blamed a woman, right? It's all her fault. She's the source of evil in the world. Yeah, really. Okay. So her punishment is pain in childbirth. Um, and her punishment is you will yearn for your husband. Okay, so you know what? At creation, male and female, he created them. They were equal. Okay. It's after the fall that there's this yearning that women feel incomplete without a man. But Jesus came to redeem the world, huh? Right? He's the new Adam, and he treats women as equals. So I don't understand this. Uh, but OK, I mean, I think it's bad theology to think you know, that this kind of inequality is what God wanted in the beginning or wanted after the after Jesus if you're a Christian so I, it doesn't make any sense to me but it's a great way to justify male domination uh, as long as you don't read the Bible too carefully 
and you don't notice that Jesus treated people as equals. Okay, because you listened, the soil is accursed because of you. With suffering shall you get your food from it every day. With the sweat of your brow shall you eat your bread. Now, you remember John Locke said that? He said, you know, so we're going to sweat and we're going to work, but that's what God wants and we're going to succeed. And God, you know, so we're doing God's will by, by working hard and exploiting nature. That, that's important that there are, you know, you can interpret it this way. So that's why Lynn White says, you know what? Eh, Christianity is, um, okay, let me explain his position. Um, it wasn't until about four generations ago that that was Western Europe and North America arranged a marriage between science and technology, between the theoretical, you know, just scientists theorizing about stuff and the application, empirical approaches to the natural environment. And there he talks about Bacon. So this is what I want you to get, that there's, he has read Bacon and Locke and all those people, right? Uh, the emergence in widespread practice of the Baconian creed, right? That knowledge is power. Scientific knowledge means technological power over na nature. Um, started, you know, about um, 1850, whatever. But that's, he understands the impact of this attitude. Um, almost at once, the new situation forced, that's when the concept of eco ecology emerged, because somebody wanted to say, wait a second, this isn't unlimited, but that did not prevail. Um, nobody paid attention to that. Over here, this paragraph, um, we should try to clarify our thinking by looking at the presuppositions that underlie modern technology and science. Science was traditionally aristocratic, speculative, intellectual. Technology was lower class, empirical, and action-oriented. Then all of a sudden, they got fused. Um, and that is connected to democracy, right? By reducing social barriers, um, there you put these together. And that's what happened in America, right? People came over. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, these original founders were, were smart, highly educated. But then all these other people came and they could combine, they, they would apply whatever people knew, right? Because they're out there in the frontier they're learning through experience. They're just really learning how to exploit nature um, to a, they're learning fast, <laughs> um, but it was related to democracy. Okay. Um, then, you know, the Western tradition, I didn't make you read that. If you want to, you can, but you definitely don't have to. Um, Yeah, okay, next page, down here. Okay, so um, I want you to think about if paganism, if there, there is an indigenous culture in your society that still is very respectful of the natural world. I know that when I visited Indonesia, one of my friends who taught, he had a PhD in education, but he came from a little village and the village still worshiped this tree. There was a big tree and they still, um, I think gave sort of uh, rituals and gifts to that tree 
and the spirit of the tree, right? It was part of their life. They were also Muslims <laughs> and they had this Hindu, I mean, they mixed uh, paganism, Hinduism and Islam. They had this wonderful mix of these things. They were, they called themselves Muslim, but they didn't pray five times a day. And um, so also Hinduism has a lot of, I don't know, I'd just be curious to know if your society has some sort of mix of these things, like they didn't really give up paganism entirely. Um, but the influence of the West is um, Christianity tied to industrialization, obviously, um, but also the faith in perpetual progress. So you remember how John Stuart Mill's faith in progress was behind his belief that free speech, everybody should be able to say everything um, and it will all turn out fine. And then Karl Marx also, just have the proletariat take over and everything will turn out peachy keen. <laughs> so that that's very Western, um, rather than to see things as cycles. Um, the fact that communism shares this sort of um, perpetual progress view shows how influential it is. Then um, Aristotle, they, they had a much more cyclical view. And um, I don't, again, in your country with Hinduism, with Buddhism, um, I think it's much more cyclical, but, it, but I'm curious to know where in your life, what sort of a synthesizing of these views are you, um, has influenced you in your worldview? Um, and this is where Lynn White interprets the story that I start from Genesis as man named the animals establishing his dominance, right? God planned all of this explicitly for man's benefit um, so no item in the physical creation has any purpose save to serve man's purposes. Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion in the world. So he's very critical and he thinks Christianity is the blame for a lot of the problems. Um, okay, let's see. And then at the very end, I had you read the last page where he recommends St. Francis as an alternative because Francis did respect animals and talked about them as sacred and all that. And my main point there that I want you to remember is that Pope Francis is very aware that he, his name, right? He might have given himself that name, maybe for this reason, I don't know. But everybody in Christianity and everybody, especially in the Catholic Church, knows the Pope is named Pope Francis and St. Francis loved nature. He was a standout in the, in the Catholic tradition, the Christian tradition. So the Pope is really taking advantage of that and I think in the future, you will see the Pope pushing and pushing for sustainability. Um, but time will tell. Anyway, you, I think looking at it from, I, I know one of this, I, there are very few students who are Catholic or Christian, but I think there's some in this class. And so that would be something for them to think about. Um, and then, uh, whoops, that's that one. All right, then there's um, Montcrief. I'm trying to think, I think, so I'm gonna talk a little more about this, but I want each of you to write down, if you haven't already, what do you think, right? Do you agree with Lynn White 
that the Genesis excerpts are about man's domination. Do you think that St. Francis would be a better model for Christians, even if you're not Christian? But, do, or do you understand how John Locke's view of Christianity is really feeds environmental destruction in the name of religion, which is what Karl Marx points out, right? That the religion is a whitewash, right? Covers up what's really going on. All right. Then we had Moncrief. Um, and Uh, he quotes from Lynn White. Let me. Okay. All right. This section is about this link between democracy and exploitation, the growth in science and technology, and um, the growth in a middle class, the growth in social mobility, and that. Karl Marx talked about that. And, um, and I think a lot of that is true in your countries, that what happened in the West earlier is happening in your countries more recently. That when the capitalists came in, it, was, it came at about the same time as free elections, right? Democracy. <laughs> And just like in Cambodia, right? So that's what he's talking about here, that they happened, they're interrelated in these ways. But as Karl Marx said, underneath it, money is sticking to money. Um, it's, it's more equitable, the, distribu the distribution of wealth, I think, Partly it isn't that it's more equitable, but there, for temporarily, the exploitation of resources did lead to enough extra wealth that even poor people would have more rice to eat, at least for a while, right? So everybody benefited at least a little bit. And so there was more of a push, you know, to keep going in this direction because I am more affluent than I used to be. And I'm not paying attention to the fact that, yeah, but the people at the top are really cashing in. It's just my life is better. And I think my children's life will be better. And my grandchildren's life will be better. And um, the question is, right, will it? But at least for a while, everybody believed that. Um, okay. Conclusion, all right. The forces of democracy, technology, urbanization, individual wealth, and an aggressive attitude toward nature are directly related to the crisis. The Judeo-Christian tradition probably influenced it, but um, there are plenty of other countries that aren't Judeo-Christian that are doing it. So here's something else for you to think about. Is there less tendency for those who control the resources of non-Christian cultures to live in extravagant affluence with attendant high levels of waste and inefficient um, consumption, right? Is there less of a tendency or do they do the same things that we do? If non-Christian cultures had the same levels of economic productivity, urbanization, high average income, is there evidence to indicate these cultures would not exploit nature the way ours does? Or is everybody motivated by the same stuff, right? So is it really a religious problem or are these other things really the problem? So, what do you think, right? So I'm give you a minute to write that down. Um, is it true in your country that people are doing the same things? And is the reason 
just capitalism, democracy, urbanization, increased wealth, population, um, <laughs> individual resource ownership. Everybody's getting a little richer, so they definitely want to keep going, but it's at the expense of the environment. So is that going on in your countries? Is religion used to justify it? Or is religion used to criticize it? So I'll just give you a, give you a, a minute to write that down. And that's what you can talk about in your groups. All right, and then one more thing for you to talk about in your groups. If you are Muslim, you have that same creation story, I think. And so Patrick Duvall interprets the story differently. So this is what, oops. Yeah, okay. Trust for future generations. All right. This is how he interprets it. Who owns the earth, right? Who owns the earth? God, not people. What kind of world did God create? Um, it's physical and it's ethical. Things coexist in, in our intricate harmony um, and he quotes all over the place, right? God's presence holds everything in a unity. God is constantly renewing the world. Um, God created a seamless web maintained by God's willed laws. All the creatures of the earth share in the goodness of the creation. It's independently good. It ought to be respected as independently good. Um, animals participate in the, in the covenant. Um, okay, God said, okay, this is a sign of the covenant. Uh, I make between me and you and every li living creature, right? Um, so, Every creature is related to God. And the last point is that God bestows the earth, but um, as not sovereign control, right? They're stewards. God gave the earth for human beings to um, be stewards, to take care of it. No one generation possesses it. It has to be passed on to future generations. So if you cause it to decline, the creation to start degenerating, that's on you, right? There's no way God wanted you to do that. Um, the heritage is something of enduring value designed to benefit future generations. Christians should be duty bound to conserve the resources. Each generation exists only as a pilgrim, only temporarily. The earth is a trust for future generations. So we need to limit ourselves so that we can pass on this trust. Okay, so what I wanna ask you here is, do you think that's a better reading of the Bible? Then from your, if you're a secular, if you take a purely secular point of view, do you just say, yeah, based on science, 
and secular values, yeah, I think we should pass on at least, you know, the natural world needs to be preserved to the next generation. That's science. <laughs> that You don't need religion for that. Um, or do you think, no, religion is, I'm religious. And to me, that covenant relationship, the earth is sacred, that makes sense to me. And so I prefer a religious interpretation. Now you can say it's Christian or it's Hindu or it's Buddhist or it's Muslim, but you should have, I want you to have some opinion about that. Do you think our attitude should be that we're stewards and we have to pass it on at least in, a, in as good a shape as it was passed to us, but even if the generation before us de de deteriorated the environment, we need to try to find a way to replenish it because it's a covenant between God and humanity. And so we have to try and preserve the covenant relationship. Um, all right. So write down what you want to talk in your group about that, the idea of a covenant. And I will put you into breakout rooms for 15 minutes. And then there'll be any sort of questions to, to wrap it up. And that will be it. So <clears throat> I hope pe people feel more on board after today. Um, can, you, can you see how things are connected? What did you say, Professor? Did you that again, please? Can you see how the, the the lectures are connected to each other? Right. I I understand that. Um, you know, it's not like a textbook. It's harder. And um, but the the class will change after this. Um, because you can find your own examples and we can be living more in the present. But I do think that background is important. So um, let me see, is everybody back? There's not that many people left. <laughs> But let me just look at the screen for a sec and let me show you what I've posted for next time. Um, here's the post for the paper. I will, right after, um, in five minutes, I will add an attachment, which is a paper grade worksheet, which shows what criteria I'm looking for in a paper. Um, and here's the post. So let's see, I think, oh, let me see if I, all right, I'm gonna have to, what I'm gonna do is change post number six to say summary, and then I'll make post number seven be the book, the Christianity one. Here's the paper. Here's the article on Islam. So for next time, we'll spend, um, okay, I'll go over the article. Let's see, today, all right. So for next time, we're going to just do Islam. Oh, sir. Yeah? Uh, what should we do, like, if we already do number six? Like, for me, I did number six, so now I need to do it again. You don't have to. I think I gave you an opportunity to, if you wanted to do it again, but you don't have to. Uh -uh. Okay, so uh, is that okay? I didn't do number seven. I left number seven. So is that okay? Even if we change, if I do only number seven? I mean, if I change the number, you could just repost it on the, you know, under the different... Uh, okay, okay. Let me see. Just repost it, you know, sort of take it off the one post and put it on the other post. Is that okay?
Oh, yeah, okay, I'll do that, maybe. <laughs> okay, thank you. You were getting ahead. Okay, for June 15th, read this Islam. Um, I think I'll pick certain pages for you to read, and I'll do that right after class. And then go find another article about uh, Islam and the environment or re the religious or humanistic tradition you were raised in and its position on the environment. Read it and be ready to report to the class on what you found and what you think about it, right? Um, the article has to be at least six pages and written by some respected scholar, right? Okay, so we will just go, you know, in the class, each student will report on the article that they found. So I'll only pick about five pages out of this article for you to read so that the total number of pages is like 11 pages. Maybe I'll pick seven pages, but I, you know, usually about 15 pages per class. Um, and then the day after that will be Buddhism and, hum and Hinduism. I have them on the same day. That's why I only have Islam this day. And if you are Hindu or Buddhist, you can do that for the assignment, whatever. Um, all right, any other questions? Hello, ma'am. Okay, well, have a good night and I'll see you in a couple days. It's see you, you ma'am. Right now, it's, it's 11.30 in Bangladesh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, good night to you. Good night, Professor. Good, night. Bye -bye. good morning. <laughs> Whatever.